Folks, as I mentioned in class today or yesterday, by the time that you're seeing this, when Hitler went after Britain, it truly was a climactic moment, not just for Europe, as he was now attempting to leave the continent, but really all that stood between continental Europe and the United States was Britain. Now, Britain was far more stout than any of the other countries, many of whom uh, basically didn't have the military might or just didn't know what exactly to do with Hitler. So the Battle of Britain, which basically occurs sort of right in the middle of 1940, really is important in terms of the German Luftwaffe that are bombing strategic areas and then ultimately start to actually bomb civilians to weaken morale. And so Britain is bending and bending and bending, but it does not break. And that's important because as the United States is watching this, they're moving again from isolations to intervention. Now, again, we've already seen cash and carry, and now we're going to see the first peacetime draft in U.S. history. Yes, there have been a number of drafts, but they've always been in wartime. Technically, the United States is not yet at war, although it's getting closer and closer. And so all men 21 to 35 had to register for the draft, and about a million men were originally drafted. And, and many of them actually were there for 12 months, and they actually talked about deserting when that was all over. But then by 1941, when Pearl Harbor is attacked, there's a huge surge of people that actually do volunteer for the war. And at that point, there's actually increased down to 18, all the way up to 45 could be drafted. Now, you've got your D and then you've got your double D to get your triple D. And so at the same time that this is all happening, um, the United States looks at Britain and Britain says, well, listen, we need help. We are under assault. So the United States gives a whole bunch of sort of aging warships that it doesn't need anymore in exchange for strategic British bases in the Caribbean. So it's sort of like, you need this and we need this. So here's an exchange. So now you've gone from cash and carry to two ocean Navy to draft to destroyers deal. The United States is not yet in the war, but it's getting closer. But at the same time, it's also helping Britain withstand this attack. And then the fact is, is that Britain does withstand the attack and it's pretty remarkable and it's considered a pretty major turning point in the European war about Hitler not winning. It seemed that he was on this tremendous winning streak. Now, if you look at this sort of crystal ball here, we think about, you know, Der Führer, you know, I don't see you making this sort of magic journey across the English Channel, which incidentally, you know, in 1944, Eisenhower is actually going to lead them the other way from England to France on D-Day. It was a pretty ambitious plan, this Operation Sea Lion, which would have been an amphibious as well as airborne invasion of Britain. And in fact, you know, Britain stands tall. It was their finest hour and it was their darkest hour, as Winston Churchill said. And in the end, they win. But while all this is happening and as cash and carry is happening and two ocean navy is happening in a draft and destroyers deal, there are people that are saying we are getting precariously close to being in war and we should not be in war. So we actually hear this term that's actually used by Trump, this America first term. And it's actually a term that goes back to people like Charles Lindbergh in the America first committee, who essentially said, well, listen, we're isolationists. And we think that you guys are getting away from those, you know, neutrality acts of 35 and 36 and 37. And they said, instead, we should build America's defense. So we should never be able to be attacked. And, and again, you might say, well, how would we ever be attacked? But at the same time, you know, if only Britain is, is there in between, maybe there is a chance. And so it was not just about American sort of preparedness. It was also this idea that American democracy is only able to be maintained as long as we don't get ourselves involved in foreign wars. And this is certainly something that people had you know, said many times over in terms of why we should focus at home. Now, FDR had started using this term, this four word phrase, all aid short of war. I recognize that if you add all, it's five words. But the idea was sort of like we can give aid and not be involved in war so we can sort of feel good about what we're doing and helping the allies, but we're not actually in the war. And Lindbergh, again, remember, like you old Lindy from, you know, the spirit of St. Louis in the 1920s, he's like, no, 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 no. 
there's no such thing as age short of war. Once you're doing that, you're doing that and you're in. So America First was, again, a very isolationist group. And Dr. Seuss went out after them like he did all isolationists. So here's Lucky Lindbergh. You know, it's smart to shop at Adolf's. So the idea is, is that by being isolationist, you're helping Hitler win. Here we go again. You've got the ostrich, the United States of America, the Lindbergh Quarter. So, you know, again, burying your head in the sand is not going to help anyone. Or this one here, where you've got the Siamese beard between America first and the Nazis, that if you're America first, you're actually sort of pro-Hitler. Now, this also played in, in fact, to the fact that Lindbergh was actually pretty anti-Semitic. So there's, there's other elements there as well. Here you have a boxer uh, who, you know, has got America first tying him up at his feet. So Uncle Sam cannot fight. This one is pretty weird. You've got America first sitting, you know, happily in a bathtub full of a bunch of scary fish and alligators. They're all Nazis. Okay. We're happy here in our American hemisphere while everything is going haywire. And then lastly, if you like marsupials, you've got America first that has got a Nazi, that has got a fascist, that has got a communist, all sort of in its pouch with the idea that if you're America first, you're allowing all of this to sort of you know run rampant across Europe, and we're being again ostriches. We're burying our head in the sand. Now, as the Battle of Britain you know ended in you know October of 1940, and America is getting more and more involved. FDR is elected for now for the third time, the first president ever to be elected a third time. He will be elected a fourth time later on in 44. And in his inaugural address, he talks about the four freedoms. And it's important to note that Norman Rockwell, the famous painter, sort of you know portrayed these as well. And first thing he says is that you need to be able to speak and express yourself, freedom of speech. Secondly, you need to be able to worship God. Now that's also important because certainly with what Hitler was doing, also with what you know the Soviets were doing, there's a real limit on worship. The third is freedom from want. That means you shouldn't have to want anything. You should be able to have what you can have and, and not go hungry. And the last one he's really talking about is there's shouldn't be afraid. And you shouldn't have to worry about acts of physical aggression. And he says, lastly, this is no vision of a distant millennium. This is basically something that we can have. But we don't have this right now in which we have tyranny and dictators seeking to create all of this awfulness with the crash of a bomb, certainly not referring to the atomic bomb, which is certainly coming, something that he does not, quote unquote, pull the trigger on. But Truman does um, after FDR dies. But this is really sort of putting out there an agenda without putting out an agenda like we are going to fight. But if you look, it's January 6th. You know, we don't get involved until December of the same year. OK, so if we think about where we've been in terms of sort of getting our toe in and then our foot in and then our ankle in and then our chin in and our knee in, cash and carry to the two ocean Navy to draft and destroyers deal. OK, and now we're going to get to lend lease, which truly is a very significant moment. It's so significant that the bill was actually 1776, as in freedom. OK, and it was called a bill to further promote the defense of the United States, again, sort of defending the United States, but not actually getting involved in war. So what's fascinating about Lend-Lease is it's literally in the name. You're just lending stuff. So you're lending warships, warplanes, and types of other weaponry to the Allies, as well as the Chinese, who are going to fight the Japanese, and, and later the Soviets. The loaned materials, literally, like, here are weapons. We're loaning them to you. You don't have to pay. Like, just give them back when you're done. It's, it sounds ridiculous. And the amount was amazing. $50 billion at the time, over $500 billion in today's value. And it was so obvious that it was going against the neutrality acts. Like, we weren't in war, but literally supplying our allies with everything and saying, you don't have to pay us back. But it also, along with cash and carry earlier from 1939, really moves the economy from a peacetime economy during the depression to a wartime one and really pulls the United States out of the depression. So it's impossible to say if FDR's New Deal really worked. It's really these sort of pre-war economic boosts along with the actual war, which is going to come, you know, again, at the end of 41 into 42, that really pulls the United States out. So at Lend-Lease, you're, you're really seeing the United States in so much so that Hitler looked at it and was like, wait a second, like you guys are literally 
in the war against us. And we're like, no, 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 we're not. And he says, you know, you're playing with dynamite. And sort of Uncle Sam's response was like, well, finally, we're realizing that if we don't do anything, we're also playing with dynamite. So we're going to do something to really help save ourselves and save our allies. So once Hitler sees this happening, you know, again, we can sort of see in the tea leaves that war is coming. Now, what we also should have seen in the tea leaves is the fact that Hitler was going to stab Stalin in the back. They're you know, such weird bedfellows to begin with. Um, they got together because they had this, you know, common pie in Poland they wanted to carve up. But in the end, Hitler stabbed Stalin in the back. And he has the hubris of thinking, well, I can just go right into the Soviet Union, just like I've been going throughout Eastern Europe, just like I've been going through Scandinavia, just like I've been going through the Low Countries, just like I went through France. Didn't go through Britain, but he says, I can take Russia. So he's going to bring that big Russian bear uh, into his taxidermist, you know, we saw Hitler as a dentist earlier, and, and most expected the Soviets to surrender. Uh, again, tremendous, you know, population, but assumed that no one was a match for Hitler. Now, in the end, it, it, it was Hitler's huge miscalculation about dealing with just the massive number that the Soviets could throw at him, along with the Russian winter. And in fact, Hitler really gets bogged down in the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Soviets are going to lose a tremendous amount of people, um, which is going to contribute later on to the Cold War, which we're not really going to talk about. But um, certainly the Soviets do withstand uh, Hitler. Now, it doesn't mean that Hitler is not, you know, <laughs> through his propaganda machine saying, look, look what we're doing. We're killing so many Russians. And if you look at this, you know, upper cartoon, it's like, you know, the annihilation is proceeding according to schedule. Well, yeah, if you're just taking up the tiniest part of the tail of something that is so enormous, you're really not doing much. And ultimately, FDR does give aid through lend lease to the Soviets. And, and again, remember, the United States and the Soviets are going to fight together on the Allied side. It's not going to be until the end of the war that they really sort of separate and it sort of, you know, freezes into that Cold War. Okay. Now, it's important to realize that just as Wilson had sort of given his 14 points before the end of World War I and sort of set the stage for what he was going to do in France, FDR is going to sort of announce his intentions before we even enter the war officially. So we're now at the MM, which is sort of meeting in the Maritimes. Maritimes are Canadian provinces on the most uh, eastern part of Canada. And so this is called the Atlantic Conference. And they, at the Atlantic Conference on a boat in Newfoundland, Canada, they actually have the Atlantic Charter. Now it's important to realize that, you know, there's no military commitments made. It's not like FDR says to Churchill, like we're in, we're in, definitely we're in, but it's sort of like, well, if we're gonna be in at some point, I just wanna make sure we're on the same page. So they set out what he called certain principles for a better future for the world. It sounds a little bit like a Wilsonian bubbler, but FDR certainly wasn't, okay? Now, key specifics feel very Wilsonian, like there's gonna be no territorial gains, so we're not imperial. Um, the self-determination, we'd seen that in the 14 points. Trade barriers lowered, free trade, we'd seen that in the 14 points. They're talking about having collective security at the end. Well, we certainly saw that with the League of Nations. This is going to be the UN, okay? And there's going to be freedom of the seas. Holy Moses, we've been talking about that forever, okay? And then disarmament of aggressor nations. So it literally is like the 14 points part du. But in this particular case, you're dealing with FDR. And you're not dealing with Wilson. So there's negotiations sort of about what, what's our common vision if we are to get involved in the war. But sort of as all this is happening, we're giving a ton of aid to the British. But there's a problem is that the British ships are being taken out by the German U-boats. It's very, very dangerous. So even though we're giving them aid, it's not exactly getting there. And so there's this question of like, well, what do we do if we're giving them aid and it's not getting there? What more can we do? So we agree to convoy, which basically means put our ships around their ships and sort of escort them there. And that's a that's a big deal because now that's you know putting American lives in harm's way. But the argument was is that like it's sort of like if you get two thirds of the way to England and then you're not helping them get all the way, like what good is the aid to begin with? So the decision was is that lend lease wasn't enough. That you're actually going to have to use you know U.S. ships to convoy. British ships. Well, that's a problem because now U-boats are taking out American ships. 
So you move from lend lease to convoy to what's known as shoot on site. So there's an American ship called the Greer that is taken out by a German U boat. So then America says, okay, well, now, you know, as, as soon as you see a German sub, you know, if you're an American ship, you can shoot on site. So again, we're getting closer and closer and closer. And then there's another American ship, the Reuben James, that is that is sunk. And now at this point, Congress is like, listen, enough is enough. We're going to actually allow merchant ships that, that are not military ships, okay, to be armed, okay? So, you know, really, if we're going to follow this, it goes, you know, from all this, no formal action, no formal action, no formal action, no formal action, to cash and carry, to two ocean Navy, to draft, to destroyers deal, to lend lease, to convoy, to shoot on site, okay? So in 1941, what we're seeing here is the United States is not yet at war, but there's so much incremental involvement that has gone on. And so the question is, like, at what point, like, should we intervene? Should we not? We still are at a point where we might not intervene. So, of course, this idea of the fascism that is going on in Europe, and certainly it's not just with Hitler. We saw it with Mussolini in Italy. We see it with Franco in Spain. You know, France and Britain have been our allies going all the way back. Yes, we're jumping in and out of bed between Britain and France early on, but they are our allies. We're under attack, whether it's the Panay in China, whether it's, you know, American ships that are involved in getting shot out in the Atlantic. The question of the Jews is a very, very tough one because there, there is evidence that people in the State Department knew about what was going on, maybe not the extent that it was going on with the concentration camps and the death camps, but there were people that did know. And of course, there's this argument that if we don't fight, then Hitler will attack the United States. It's a far-fetched one, but there's some people who said that. And then, of course, there's these sort of loftier ideals in the 14 points. But on the flip side, it's like, it's not our place to fight. This is These are not our issues. Like, we learned that from World War I. Also, don't send men to die. FDR ran in 1940 and said, I am not going, just like Wilson had run in 1916 and says, I'm not putting your boys in harm's way. There's also this idea that with all age short of war, the United States economy can do well without ever endangering American lives. Then, of course, you've got the Nye report that said, you know, again, World War One was all about merchants of death, bankers and weapons makers. Don't you know, don't put our our boys in harm's way for that. You know, also, we don't want to loan money because we don't want to have to have people that are in debt that can't pay us back. OK. And then at the you know, there's always the argument that we need to focus on problems at home particularly, you know, we're dealing with a depression or we've been dealing with a depression for the 1930s. So don't go hurting any improvements that we have by getting ourselves into war. And then, of course, there's the, you know, American exceptionalism. Like the best way to fight fascism is to be a city on a hill, to sort of show the world what we can be. And then the America first idea that we need to pr protect the United States, what they call Fortress America. OK, now, you know, again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That even though there's more reasons to remain isolated on the right side, it was clear that America was much more leaning to intervene. They just sort of needed a push, if you will. And I hate to use that analogy, but certainly what happens does not come from Germany, does not come from Italy, does not come from Spain. It comes from Japan. And I'm not going to go into all the diplomatic issues that have been going on between America and Japan, but certainly it's important to understand that, that there was a real threat the, of the Japanese coming to attack. And in fact, there was a thought that the Japanese were going to attack, but somewhere else, maybe American possessions in the Philippines or somewhere else. But on the morning of December 7th, 1941, Japanese bombers are sort of hundreds of miles away, taking off from aircraft carriers, and they launch a surprise attack. And the military commanders in Hawaii, the American military commanders, again, it's a territory, it's not a state at this point, they, they quite possibly had the worst setup. All of the ships are bunched together so that like literally if you're bombing from the sky, it's just one really easy target. And as a result, it's just devastating in terms of the loss of battleships and airplanes. There's a, just a tremendously fortunate deal is that the American aircraft carriers actually are out doing exercises and we're not at Pearl Harbor that day. And in fact, those aircraft carriers are going to be incredibly important in fighting the Japanese in what we call the Pacific theater. So again, it's, it's devastating. But there's just the tiniest silver lining. Now, obviously, FDR calls this a day that will live in infamy. 
no matter how long it may take us to overcome the premeditated invasion, it's really important to focus on just how violated America felt by being attacked on its own soil. It never was attacked. You know, like the War of 1812, maybe <laughs> if you're talking about the lead up to the Mexican-American War, but it rarely happens. And it says, you know, like the, the Americans will win through to absolute victory. And in many ways, we've talked about this idea of a nap. We've seen, you know, a sleep, you know, Lady Liberty asleep. And here it's like, you know, what happened, Uncle Sam? You know, you the big ostrich, you had your head in your sand. And, you know, it shows the Japanese not as truly, you know, devastatingly um, malicious, but almost more of like a nuisance. Like, look what they're doing to the ostrich, Uncle Sam. You know, they're, they're hot footing him. They're hitting him on the head. They're drilling his back. But at the same time, they're sort of trying to downplay, you know, what the Japanese could do by depicting him this way. But in fact, it was a tremendous surprise and a tremendous wake up call. And this whole idea of isolationism is gone. He never knew what hit him. And so that whole idea of isolationism, no more ostriches, we are now going to be involved. And so after all of these years of build up and build up and build up, finally, it seems that Americans are committed to go to war. So the day after Pearl Harbor, FDR goes to Capitol Hill and there's only one person uh, a woman from Montana who votes against the war. She'd actually voted against World War I as well. Interestingly, she'd only been in Congress for two terms, those two terms. And then three days later, Germany and Italy also declare war on the United States. So now the United States is going to be at war against Japan, Italy, and Germany. So it's important to realize in the big picture that the United States has never been prepared for any war, you know, from the War of 1812 all the way up to World War I. But as the war had gone on in Europe, we've seen how the United States did start building up its military and also had started to move a little bit, you know, from a peacetime economy into a wartime economy. So after Pearl Harbor, the United States has to act quickly, but it actually had a running start, something it never had before. What's different here is it's going to have to fight on two very different fronts. It's going to have to fight in the Pacific. It's going to have to fight in Europe before it even gets to Europe. It's going to go through North Africa. So it's it really is, you know, a cataclysmic event. And we'll discuss that much more next week.